So if you have your Bible here, I want to encourage you to open up Mark chapter 8. And I've got a question for you. Um, the question is this, who do people say Jesus is today? And that comes directly from the text. And so as you're thinking about it here, writing in on the text, on the text feed here, I'm kind of scanning back and forth to see who's here with us right now. See a great number of people. So glad to see you all with us. Uh, there's a couple here that just moved recently. They're not on here tonight. They have been. The shoemakers just recently moved. And so we're going to miss them. I'm going to miss them a lot. They're great neighbors. Uh, we're going to miss them. But pray God blesses them in the next journey. And I hope they'll, they'll be able to join us online too. Um, as Stephanie told me the other day that she likes seeing me on her TV. I told her you have to worry about that because this face was built for radio. So just be cautious. Uh, anyway, so Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Uh, here's what the Bible says, and the question coming up in just a moment that I'd like you to, to kind of engage here a little bit, if you will. Who do people Jesus say Jesus is today? So Mark chapter 8. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Who do, you, who do the people say I am? He just asked his disciples, they're going from one place to the other. I want you to notice here a couple things about this as we get to that question of who do people today say Jesus is? And we can see some comments coming through. Um, this region here, Caesarea Philippi, is really kind of interesting. This moment, and we see it in all the Gospels, is a turning point in the ministry uh, of Jesus. Uh, up to this point, uh, we see a more focus on specific disciples. We see Jesus moving his way to Jerusalem. Uh, it's a major shift in how Jesus is doing ministry and the point of ministry. This is a major moment. Now it's interesting here, Caesarea Philippi, a Caesarea is, is similar to Caesar. And so that, that gives us the clue here that this particular region was named in honor of a Caesar. Now Caesar comes from a Greek word meaning uh, a kurios, which also means uh, a Lord. And so here in this particular city, we have this, or this place, of, of Lord of Philippi, Caesar of Caesarea Philippi, Peter is asking, or excuse me, Jesus is asking the disciples, and, and we'll narrow in on Peter in his conversation, asking them, Who do the people say that I am? Here's the Lord asking the people in the region honoring somebody else, Who do these people say that I am? So let me answer the question here Who do people say that Jesus is? See a couple things here. Uh, we do want to pray for the bridge crew on 65. That is a dangerous job. Um, I'm not seeing any messages come through. God, I'm giving you all a chance to talk in church. So, um, well, think about this. Sometimes people say Jesus is. They say Jesus is a good teacher. We see hear that often. Uh, Jesus was a, a man. We think that Jesus was someone uh, who, some even question if Jesus even existed. Um, some even today would say that Jesus is, is someone spiritual, a, a leader, uh, but not necessarily for them, someone that they would follow. And so there's a, a lot of conversation about who people say Jesus is. Fontella, thank you, Fontella, a prophet, a good man, Janice, excellent. Thank you guys for engaging here. A uh, good man, he's the man upstairs. You're right, Teresa, say he's the man upstairs. Uh, so we have all kinds of names for Jesus. Jesus is, is making this poll here of the, the disciples, trying to, to get them. Now, I want you to notice the context here about what's about and this shift that's about to happen. In chapter 8, uh, we have Jesus engaging with the Pharisees. He's feeding the 4,000, engaging with the Pharisees. who want a sign for him to prove who he is. Then we have the, Jesus warns them about the uh, Pharisees and of Herod in, in chapter 8, verses 14 through 21. And, it closes it, and then it uh, closes with the question, uh, as they're traveling, says, Do you not yet understand? Understanding is seeing, coming together. 
He heals the blind man, as we talked about last time together, touches him twice so that he would see, and then as a seeing, he would have understanding as an active parable there for the disciples. Now he's coming to and asking the disciples, who do the people say, who do they see me as? And then how do you see me as? Now they say here that he's John the Baptist. If you go back to Mark chapter 6, Verses 14 through 29, we'll be able to see that episode where uh, Herod is, uh, and where John the Baptist is in prison, and Herod and John loses his life. They, Jesus is introduced in that section as they, they interpret him to be John the Baptist, and that Mark chapter, chapter 6, excuse me, explains that. So some thought he was John the Baptist. Some thought he was Elijah. Now, why is that, why is that important? Elijah is to have, in, in the, the, the Jewish tradition, and, and Orthodox Jews hold to this today, Elijah is to return ahead of the Messiah, in front of the Messiah. Now, in the Gospel of Mark and in the Gospel of Matthew, at the Mount of Transfiguration, which we'll get to uh, probably not next time, but the time after that, Jesus declares that Elijah has come, and John the Baptist was the type of Elijah. He was the front runner. So in that statement, Jesus is saying, uh, one, that he is the Messiah because Elijah has already come, and John the Baptist was a type of Elijah in the way that he practiced his prophecy and the way he conducted himself within the wilderness. And so John, Jesus is identifying John the Baptist as the Elijah type. Now this is interesting here, and this is from a, a, a website of, of Jewish teaching, the Shabbat.org slash holidays, talking about Passover. And, and this is something that you might find interesting. Uh, today, traditional Jews law are also looking for Elijah to come, as I mentioned that. They, let me read you here some of the things that they do. When they celebrate the Passover in the Talmud, there's an open question if there are four or five cups in the Passover. Um, the issue was res never resolved. They pour a fifth cup and not to drink it. Now that fifth cup is the Elijah cup. After coming, heralding the coming of the Messiah, one of Elijah's tasks will be to resolve unanswered questions. Thus the fifth cup whose status is doubted is dubbed the Elijah cup is an anticipation of the insight that Elijah will shed on the matter, according to this website. Second, to talk about the Elijah cup, that the four cups in the Passover meal correspond to four expressions of redemption from the Passover, such as, I will take you out of your suffering from Egypt, I will deliver you from their bondage, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, and I will take you to myself. So those four cups. The fifth cup is the expression of redemption which comes in the following verse, I will bring you into the land. So five cups from the Passover, the Elijah cup is the fifth cup. The last cup po points to how uh, the Elijah cup will bring them into the land. The website says, this expression, however, is an allusion to the future messianic redemption, which we announce by Elijah. And this is also why we do not drink or enjoy the fifth cup, as we have not yet experienced this redemption. So, one, and one more thing here, the timing of the pouring of the cup of Elijah is also right before we start reading the Halal, which focuses on the future redemption. After commemorating the very first redemption of the Jewish people from Egypt, we express our hope and firm belief in the coming of Messiah, who will usher in the new and final redemption very soon. So you see here, when Jesus is asking the disciples, who do the people, who do the populace, who do the crowds say that I am, and they're responding with Elijah, they are saying that he is the one who's to pick up that fifth cup and begin then the ushering in of the, the Messiah who is to come. So what the people are saying is, you know, we're, we're recognizing you, but we don't see you as the Messiah. We don't see you as the Christ. We see you as, as a pre-runner, maybe. And, and that ties in with how the third part they see him as, as a prophet. Um, that he was similar to John. He was similar to other prophets, uh, which there had been before John, between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New, when John's the first prophet there, there's 400 years of silence. Imagine, beloved, 
if God did not speak for 400 years. Now, we know God has spoken because he's given us his word and, he, and he's closed that. But for 400 years, he did not speak through a prophet. Imagine in our own lives if God was silent for 400 years. It's hard to imagine. They're saying that you're, you're a prophet. So people today say that Jesus is similar. He's a teacher. He's a good man. He's the man upstairs. He's all these things, but he's not who he is. But notice what Jesus does here. He turns to the twelve and he says, Who do you say that I am? Now we know he's addressing the twelve because the, the phrasing there for you say is in a plural sense. So he's not identifying one particular person out of the twelve among them. How, who do you all, who do y'all say that I am? Then Peter speaks up. And this is a pivotal moment in Peter's life. And he has several of them. This is one of them. This is probably one of the biggest ones. Peter, from this point forward, in, the, in particular the Gospel of Mark, becomes the central focus of the Twelve. He, be, he uh, is the, um, if we go back and remember how Jesus called out all Twelve individually, and some of their callings we see in the Gospel messages and the Gospels, but Mark addresses them up as a group up to this point. We see him talk about the Twelve, the disciples, the group. They're always together beyond their individual calling, individual identity. Now, Peter begins to be singled out, and so do James, and so do John. And great focus, though, comes upon Peter, as it should, as we see Peter being the head of the church. Matthew, I think it's in chapter 16, adds some more to this particular moment. We're not going to look at that tonight, but if you want to cross-reference between the Gospels, Matthew is, is a good, has more information. Um, so, but Peter speaks up, you are the Christ. And he doesn't say, you know, you're Jesus, you're the son of the carpenter, uh, you're the son of Mary. Uh, those are all things. Those are all true. But he says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. This is a title we receive from Daniel, the title of Messiah. You are the one to usher in the kingdom of heaven. You are the one who we are looking to, who will restore our kingdom, restore the people of God to the right places in the world. We would be the center, again, of great power, of great influence. We would not be under the thumb and not be under the rulership of someone else, but we would be an independent nation again. So his, his thinking is still, and a majority of people, we see this because of the evidence that comes from the Scriptures, is still thinking of Jesus as the Messiah, and the Messiah is to usher in an earthly kingdom, one that is tangible. This title, they, though, that he, he receives here, uh, we know, because we, we have the Holy Spirit within us, we have the whole of God's Word, we understand that Jesus is ushering in a kingdom, but not in the sense that, uh, that they are expecting here. Jesus then charges them to be quiet. Now, in Matthew, he goes into a greater dialogue with Peter. He says, upon my, You are the rock upon which I will build my church, which the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let me just pause there a second. As you go back and look at those things coming together, you're smart people, you know, and the Lord will open, these, open the word to you. The church will always prevail. The church is the, the ecclesia, the called out men and women of God will always prevail. It may look different than we know it and, and have known it. But the church will always prevail. It may not be the same structures that we're used to. It may not be the same times that we're used to. Uh, although I think there's a biblical command to worship together on the first day of the week. But the church will always prevail until the Lord comes and returns and establishes the eternal kingdom of God forever. And then at that point, the church is absorbed into the kingdom of heaven. But the church will always prevail. We need to have confidence in knowing that no matter what happens to a, our physical location, what happens to uh, us as a, as a body of believers that God's church will always prevail. His people called to himself, called to be together, will always prevail. And Jesus establishes that. But notice here that then Jesus charges them to be quiet. So i got another question coming up. So get your phone ready, get your computer ready. Um, he, he, Jesus charges them to be quiet. 
Commentators here point out, and, and here, so here's the question, and I'll say something here. Um, why do you think that Jesus would charge them and command them to be quiet? Why do you think he would do that? Would, and type that in, write that into the, the comment thread here. Um, the commentators here point out that the charge to be quiet, the charge to be silent, is a strong rebuke. Stronger than the other times that Jesus stresses the secrecy. So we go through the Gospels, we begin to see Jesus told, healed someone, told him not to say anything. Uh, did these miracles and said, don't say anything. Be very quiet about these things. Um, but here, in this particular moment, he charges Peter and the twelve who are listening in to say nothing about this. Tell no one about him. This is a strong review. Why do you think that is? That's the case here. I'm checking. That. I'll check the thread. I forget. There's about a 25 second delay from when I speak into when things come up. So I'll check it back here in a minute. Pam, not ready to go public. That's a good good possibility. It, it's very possible because if he goes public here. Uh, with this notion that he is the Christ and the disciples are saying he's the Christ, Peter is proclaiming that he is the Christ, uh, then uh, he would, that contention that would raise up again even more. Uh, another possibility here is that he's not, he, he's not, uh, it's not his right time. Galatians tells us at the right time Jesus died. This is not the right time, so it's not time for that to, to be there yet. Uh, so he charges them to be quiet. Uh, I don't think he, I think here that he didn't want to escalate the opposition, as pointed out here. I don't think that it was the right time for him to be able to do that. Uh, he has some more ministry he needs to establish before Fontella to keep him safe. That's a good possibility as well. Great, thanks for the engaging you. That's awesome. Um, so he charges them to be quiet very sternly. Then he speaks plainly to them. We're going to continue on with verse thirty-one. Um, and he began, so it's the same scene, it's the same connection. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, again, that title comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 9, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly there at the beginning of verse 32. Now, now we know, <laughs> oh, that's good, that's good. And move from ad admiration to adoration. That's a good phrase. I'll have to borrow that one later on. Um, so, so we know from, from our understanding of all the whole of scriptures that Jesus is going to die. He's moving towards Jerusalem. He's very clear here in this moment. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to die. He will be buried. He will rise again. That is his mission. That is his purpose. Jesus come, has come to save men and women. He saves them from sin. The only way which He can save them from sin is becoming the sacrifice that is needed to pay the price of sin. He receives that in His death. But in His death, He then conquers sin and conquers death, which is the result of sin, by rising from the dead. And all who place their hope in Him, their faith in Him, and trust in Him, have the hope of not only eternal life, but the resurrection of the dead. The death is been, has been completely and totally defeated. We get that. We understand it. But notice here what Jesus says here, what Mark says. He says it plainly. Now that's an important phrase as we're studying our scriptures. Often as we've read through the Gospels, we see Jesus teaching in parables. And the disciples and other people coming around him and being confused. Why are you speaking in parables? Why are you saying this? This doesn't make any sense to us. So he's speaking to them in parables. Here, Mark is drawing us to what happened that Jesus had spoken to them plainly, clearly. They understood that. So what does that mean for them? What does that mean for us? It means for them that they knew what he meant. They understood what he meant. Very plain. It means for us that this is clear what Jesus is accomplishing. Notice Peter's response there at the end of verse 32. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, the rebuke here that Peter is, is doing, and the way it's described here, as the commentators point out in the language, is that Peter is speaking to Jesus with a tone of superiority. 
In other words, as Jesus has said here, hey, I, I'm going to betray, betrayed, I'm going to be uh, mocked, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be uh, killed, and I'm going to rise again on the third day. Peter comes up along beside him and, 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 and to visualize this, puts his arm around him and says, Jesus, you stick with us and that's not going to happen. Jesus, you, you hang with us and we won't let that happen. Uh, you, you know, we, we got this, we're in control of this, we're in charge of this, what you say is going to happen, don't worry about it, because we've got it taken care of. With this, this very sense of, of, of what we've come to love about Peter, this a great sense of smugness, and a great sense of superiority, and a great sense of this is what we're going, going to do. Notice that Jesus responds to him. This is interesting. He says, uh, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. And so, so Jesus is talking to all of them. He's directly so he's speaking to Peter, but he's doing it in a way so everybody will hear what he has to say. Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Get behind me, Satan. Now, what he is, let's be clear of what he is saying and what he is not saying in this phrase, get behind me, Satan. What he is not saying is that Satan has somehow indwelled Peter. He is not saying that Satan has taken possession of Peter. He is not saying that Peter has now become uh, possessed by one of Satan's uh, minions, one of his demons, to direct his Tongue. He is not saying that, that Satan has taken control of his mouth and is speaking through him. But what he is saying is that, Peter, what you are saying is aligning with the temptations of Satan and not within the commands of God. So what he is very clear here is that, no, and, and it's amazing what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is clear. Peter is speaking temptation to him as Satan did in the wilderness. Jesus could have ushered in his kingdom. Satan gave him the opportunity to do that, three times to do that. Now Peter is echoing that same sentiment. We can bring in your kingdom and you don't have to die. And in his humanity... We see God, Jesus is both 100% God and 100% man at the exact same time. In his humanity, he is recognizing the temptation. But in his divinity, he knows the incomplete cost that that temptation would create. In his humanity, he knows this is the easy way out. I don't have to die. I don't have to be beaten. I don't have to be betrayed. I don't have to go into the grave. That's, that's in his humanity. In his divinity, he says, if I don't do these things, if I take the shortcut, it won't be sufficient. If I do not become the substitute for sin, then the sacrifice won't be enough. If I don't pay the price for their sin, then what I accomplish on them will not be enough. He has to go to the cross. When we look at all the scriptures, we come away with this idea, with the teaching of, of the penal substitutionary tone, a penal being law, uh, pen, uh, where we get penitentiary, uh, legal system, substitutionary, Jesus is placing himself in there, atonement, paying the price for our sin. Jesus paid the debt for our sin that required payment. He stepped into that. And in this temptation, Jesus is rebuking Peter and saying, Get behind me because you're delivering the temptation that I cannot have. Notice the last thing Peter, Jesus says to Peter as we see how there's a misalignment of priorities here. It says, You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So Jesus, and Jesus knows our heart. He knows your heart. He knows your thought. He knows everything we're thinking. He drives into the motivation that Peter has. It says, Peter, your heart, your mind is not set on the things of God. It's not set on the kingdom of God where moth and rust can't be destroyed. Your heart is not there. Your heart in this moment is set on the things of man. 
your ability, your confidence, your desire to protect me out of your love for me and fear of what you what you hear that is going to happen to me. Peter's motivation elevates his pride, telling Jesus, we can keep you safe. And when he was doing that, he was pursuing the kingdom of man and not the kingdom of God. Now, here's where some principles for us and how I think this can really apply to us. Uh, it is easy to begin to chase the things of man and neglect the things of God. It is easy to set our hearts and set our mind on the things of man and not on the things of God. When we feel threatened, Peter felt threatened. It's easy to begin to think, oh, how can I fix this? Instead of trusting God to engage. Now, God will lead us to action. He calls us to use wisdom. But when we feel threatened, it's easy to be the first thing to go to, oh, I need to fix this instead of, Lord, how, is this, how should I address this by your kingdom priorities? When we feel tired, it's easy to have our, our hearts and our minds sit on the things of man rather than the things of heaven. When you are tired, that is when you are great, most prone to temptation and to sin. Because you're tired. And when we're tired, it's easy to think about things of man and in this world and the things of God. When we're about to experience a loss, Peter was about to experience a loss. Jesus is telling me, hey, this is going to happen. You're going to experience a loss. When we're about to experience a loss, it's easy to come in and say, okay, I'm going to focus on the things of man. What can I do to keep this from happening? Then on the kingdom of God, God, what is it that I need to do and know about this loss that I'm about to have? Maybe that loss is what God wants. Maybe the Lord will lead you to a, a wisdom and steps to prevent that loss. But we need to go to Him first, not to our solutions. And, and that's the point that I'm trying to get to. When we come to a predicament, come to a problem, a fork in the road, we need to first come to the Lord and seek the things of the kingdom of God before we first turn to ourselves. We can make plans all day long. And the Bible tells us how to make plans all day long. But our plans are made with an understanding that we seek, are seeking first God for Him to direct our steps, not necessarily conform to our plans. Peter wanted Jesus to conform to his plan. And Jesus is confronting him and said, Peter, you need to conform yourself to the kingdom of God and not to the kingdom of man. So the question that comes to me is thinking about these particular verses is how do we then pursue the things of God? And I know that you have ways in your own life that you have seen and can give testimony to and to how you have pursued the things of God in your life. And perhaps you'd like to, to share that on the on the comment thread of things that have encouraged you to pursue the things of God. Let me give you three things that I have found in my life that have encouraged me to spend time, let me give you four actually, to spend time uh, pursuing the things of God. One of them is spending time in His Word. I mentioned at the beginning that right now in my quiet time, I'm working through Ecclesiastes and just begun Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter 1 was this morning. Um, it's, and, not, and, and so I spend time in His Word, and, and this is how I approach it. I want to read the chapter, and I'm doing kind of a chapter day. It can be a section, but I'm doing the chapter, and I'm asking the question, what is it about this chapter that stands out? And there's all kinds of diagnostic tools and worksheets and things you can work through, but what's worked well for me is what is the one thing from this chapter that, that I can just grab a hold of, and the Lord has done some great things in my life lately, encouraged me greatly uh, with that. Another second thing to help pursue the things of God is to pray. And as you're thinking of the ways in which you help pursue the things of God, but to pray. You know, I keep a running list. Some people are list people when they pray, and they keep a running list of things to pray. We have our prayer list from the church that you can certainly pray over. Um, one way to, to pray is to, to think about dividing up the days of the week. You know, on Sunday, we pray for the church and the ministries of the church and the services and the lost people that God is bringing to, to hear the gospel of Jesus uh, conviction, and also the conviction for salvation and the conviction of Christians so that they may become holier and more like God and pursue the things of God. You know, Mondays, we pray for this. Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and each day, assign a topic to be praying for that, that day. All kinds of ways to pursue prayer. In other words, 
to pursue prayer, uh, kind of a, an, an oldie but a goodie, is the ACTS acronym, A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Lord, I praise you for this. Lord, I confess my sin to you. Lord, I thank you for this. And Lord, I, I trust you to supply for me today. All kinds of ways in which we can pray. But pray. Read the Bible. Pray. Third thing here is, on a personal level is to battle temptation. You know, Ephesians reminds us that we are in a spiritual conflict. Not with flesh and blood, with spirit, with spiritual matters. And we, you and I, need to actively engage to make war on spiritual temptation. We have given, been given the promise in 1 Corinthians that if when we are tempted, we will not be tempted, but all we are bare, but God will provide a way of escape. Take the escape. Battle the temptation in your life. Lean into the Holy Spirit. If you've trusted in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives with inside you. Lean into the Holy Spirit to battle the temptation that comes your way. You and I are each tempted by different things. But you and I have the same battle cry, the same war cry, fight against temptation. And then the last one I want to add in there is the regularly assembling together. Worship is added in the thread line. Worship. Right now, it's, it looks weird. It's different. But we're still able to come together. We're still able to encourage each other. We're still able to engage with each other. We come together. In incarnation, the idea, ideally, the Bible describes an incarnational coming together, being together in worship. Right now, for the, for the betterment of our culture at large, for loving our neighbors well, we need to say, we need to be physically distant, socially connected, physically distant, loving each other in creative ways. So Bible, reading your Bible, um, praying, battling temptation, and coming together in worship and encouraging each other. So I would encourage you, um, listen to some worship music online. You just do, if you want to do a YouTube, go to YouTube, search up your favorite hymn. You'll find all kinds of editions of it. There's all kinds of radio stations you can listen to online. We have local stations in town, one, the, the Wave, uh, and one out of the lake area that brought, has a transmitter here in the area, the Spirit FM. There's so many ways to get God-honoring God music into your life. I encourage you to do that. So here's, here's two questions that we'll kind of draw this to a close tonight. First of all, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? And then just answer these for yourself. You don't have to put these on the thread line unless you want to. Who do you say Jesus is? Remember when I was a kid, God opened my ears and opened my heart to conf and opened my mouth to confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. That was something God did. So for me, as we look here, as we wrestle through the scriptures, wrestle through the issues of life, I am firm on the commitment that I made, the surrender that I made as a seven, eight year old kid, that Jesus is Lord of my life. That's who Jesus is. He is the Christ, He is the coming King, He is the, the, the prophet, uh, the priest, and the King, and He will reign forever. Jesus is Lord. Second question here to begin to think about. Oh, awesome, awesome comments. I'm going to go back and read some of those here in a minute. Um, second question here, and it, this is, this is a, a penetrating one, that the Holy Spirit will work in it, it, within you. Are you pursuing the things of God? In your life right now, can you say that I am pursuing, I am chasing hard after the things of God? Or I, I've become like, like Peter in this moment, and I'm chasing the things of man. It, it, it's easy to do that, which is why God gives us more grace. It's easy to chase the things of man, and God gives us grace when the Spirit convicts us, and we respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and we say, Lord, forgive me for chasing after the things of this world, to find my satisfaction and my joy in them, forgive me. Let me find my satisfaction and my joy of my life in you. Are you chasing the things of God? And I pray you are. 
maybe you're here tonight and you're listening online and, and, and listening down the road. You think, you know, um, if I had to really evaluate my life and, and put them in the, in the containers and on one side, the things of man and the, and the things of God, um, I'm pursuing the things of man. And I'm not pursuing anything of the things of God. And then maybe the reason is because you don't know Jesus. You've not answered the call of Jesus to, to confess Him as the Christ, as the one who saved you. And I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. I want to reach out to you. I just want to reach through this lens and say Jesus loves you and died for you. And, and promises that those who confess Him as Lord and believe in the heart God raised Him from the dead will be saved, will be rescued from sin. And when we're rescued from sin, instead of, instead of trying to fix the brokenness in our lives with, with relationships and, and careers and, and, and everything else that we can think of, we come to Jesus and we come to the Lord to remove the brokenness, to remove the sin. And then we begin to pursue the things of God, God's design and purpose for our lives. My prayer tonight is that if you don't know Jesus, you give your life to Him and you begin to pursue the purposes of God for your life. If you're a believer here tonight, my prayer is that you begin to pursue the purposes of God for your life. If you're already pursuing them, awesome. If not, chase hard after them. Let me encourage you, if you are, to keep, uh, keep chasing the things of God. Thank you for being here tonight. We're going to pray. Uh, I'm so glad to get the comments here. Uh, absolutely, amen. He's the reason to get up in the morning. He's the Father. He's the love of my life. Awesome, awesome. Online Bible study, that is fantastic, Ron Sue. Um, I'm so glad to see the comments coming through as we kind of engage this way the best we can. And I'm so glad you joined us tonight. And uh, let's pray together and, and we'll be dismissed. Father, we just come to you and th I thank you, Lord, that we can be here. And, and I thank you that, that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, he's the one who's come for us, loved us so dearly that he gave himself up uh, so, and that he would die for us. I did not think of heaven as a thing to be grasped, but added human, human flesh to himself, 100% God, 100% man, to identify with him in every way, but was without sin. And he paid the price for our sin so that we could have eternal life and life today. And so, Father, I pray that, that you would lead someone here tonight to confess Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And they would just pray in their hearts, Lord, Lord, come into my life, make me new, save me. And Lord, I pray there's someone that did that today. Lord, I thank you for everyone who's joined us in this study. May we come away from here with the, the passion and the desire to actively pursue the things of God. Knowing that Jesus is the Christ, He died for us, gave Himself up for us, was buried, rose again on the third day, conquering sin, conquering death, so that we might actively pursue God's purpose and design for our lives. Lord, you want to work in us to work through us, and thank you so much. Lord, I pray that you bless each one here and that your favor shine upon them. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, guys, thanks for joining us tonight for our Bible study. We'll pick up right where we left off next time in Mark. Uh, continue just working slowly through that and see what the Lord has for us as we, we just pull out each verse at a time and, and expositionally look through, through the Gospel of Mark. I'm glad you're able to be here tonight. Um, this next week, as we're heading into Sunday worship, we're going to continue in our study on 1 Peter, looking at verses 3 through 5, powerful, rich, packed verses. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to your friends list and, and send an invitation to them. Now, not a group invitation, not a mass blast. Send an invitation. Say, hey, will you sit with me at church on Sunday? I'm going to watch First Baptist online on Facebook, and I'm going to start a watch party, and I want you to come sit with me. Would you do that with me? And then and pray. I pray that the Lord would open conversations so He might use you to help them move one step close, closer to Jesus. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, thanks be to God for His good blessings upon us. May He bless you tonight. Have a good night.